Before we start, can I ask you just to stand to your feet for a moment? And um, if, you're, if you're still a little nervous about shaking hands, don't shake a hand then, but wave, but turn to someone and greet them. If, if, you, if they look like they might welcome a handshake, shake the hand. Otherwise, at least wave at them <laughs> and greet one another. Praise God. Amen. And before you sit down, let's pray. And I'm going to ask you one other thing right now, which is I'm going to ask you to pray with your hands open, facing upward. Amen. Praise God. And if you want to, pray this with me. Father, I come to you. And I have my hands open. Because I want to receive from you. And my heart is also open. For the work of your spirit and your word. In my life today. Come Holy Spirit. In Jesus name. Amen. And all God's people say amen and amen. Please be seated. John 3:16 For God so loved the world. If you want to read this with me, you can. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Amen. You can say amen to that. Praise God. You know, the conversation for, uh, I'm sure you're well aware now, we are going through the uh, Gospel of John, and this is going to be the the second message today from John chapter 3 concerning Jesus and Nicodemus. And I can tell you there will be at least one more on this, but this is the second one today. Uh, This conversation in John chapter 3 between Jesus and Nicodemus has given us some of the most memorable declarations of the gospel in all of the New Testament. And of all the incredible statements of the gospel in this third chapter, verse 16 is the one perhaps that that is the most famous, the most iconic, the most quoted, the most memorized of them all. It is the one Bible verse most likely to be known by unbelievers all around the world, everywhere, even if they don't know where it came from. It's the one that is known. There's hardly been uh, a major uh, sporting event uh, in the world in the past 70 years where banners, placards, t-shirts, posters emblazoned with John 3.16 haven't been seen in the crowd and subsequently televised around the world. You can see some of the pictures there at baseball games, at golf tournaments, and you see that little green 
that little green placard, John 3.16. You'll see them at the, when, you, when you look at the, in the crowd at the World Cup, at the Olympics. At whatever's going on, someone, somewhere, will have one of these banners up. Talking about John 3.16. The reference has become a part even of our cultural and political and ecological events. And you'll see it bobbing around at everything from G7 summits to climate change protests. In 2009, American footballer, football player Tim Tebow, uh, instead of the normal eye black, you know these guys wear the eye black underneath their eyes when they're playing American football. Instead of the normal eye black, he had John printed below one eye and 316 below the other. Three years later, in 2012, the NFL playoff final, his heroics on the field and public display of the verse led to John 316 being Googled by more than 94 million people. Even TV news stations. This was a, a screenshot from uh, one of the, I think the NBC network uh, had this up on the TV screens and they're asking, what is this John 316 reference? American fashion retailer Forever 21. You heard of Forever 21? I'm not old enough yet, but there you go. <laughs> Forever 21. They print the verse on the bottom of all of their shopping bags. So if you buy something from Forever 21 and you come out with the bag, if you have a look under the bag, you're carrying John 3.16 under for, uh, Forever 21. And uh, burger chain, again an American burger chain, uh, in and out Burgers, they print the reference John 3.16 on the inside of the bottom rim on every one of their cups. You can see it there, in and out, and on the inside of the bottom rim, John 3.16. You say, well, that's not even giving them the whole verse, is it? No, but it's sowing seed, isn't it? It's, it's, somebody might look at it and think, what's that? What's John 3.16? What is it? And, <laughs> and uh, Rainbow Man, um, who hasn't always been the best of witnesses, but Rainbow Man, famously seen at sporting events, around the world wearing bright colors, a rainbow wig and holding up a sign that reads John 3.16. He travels, well he did travel the world doing that, not at the moment. Now the reason this verse is so popular is that it is simply the most sublime summary of the gospel you will ever find. It is the gospel in a sentence. If anyone ever asks you to tell them the central message of Christianity in just one sentence, tell them John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And you've given the entire gospel, everything, in one sentence. But if you want to go deeper than that summary, if you want to give or get a fuller picture of the gospel, of what God was doing and how he was doing it and how it affects you, you don't have to go very far away from John 3.16. In fact, if you just look at what else Jesus says to Nicodemus in this same chapter, you will see an incredible statement of the gospel. And that's what I want to do today. I want to, in a few minutes, just take a look at the gospel as, jo as Jesus laid it out to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. But first need to say a word about the desperate situation that Nicodemus was in. You see, what Jesus says to Nicodemus 
takes on even greater significance when you bear in mind the pickle he was in. We saw in the previous message on Nicodemus that he was a prisoner of certitude. But Nicodemus is also a prisoner of law. He was also a prisoner of law. He was a Pharisee, an expert in religious law, and a teacher of Israel in such matters. But the problem with the law, as Paul pointed out in Romans 3 and verse 20, the problem with the law was that it could never make you righteous. It could only tell you that you were a sinner. The moment you look to the law of God to see what it is to be righteous, you find out that you're not righteous. You find out that you've broken it. It can only tell you that you're a sinner. In Romans 3 and verse 20, Paul says, By law comes knowledge of sin. In other words, the law wasn't given to make us righteous. It was given to show us why we're not righteous. It was actually given to show us that we needed a saviour. The moment you look to the law in the hope of doing the right thing and becoming acceptable to God, all it did was tell you that you couldn't do the right thing and would never be acceptable to God on your own. In other words, instead of conferring righteousness, the law confirmed your sinfulness. You were trapped. And Israel... Israel was trapped in a cycle of sin and a prison of religious compliance with no light at the end of the tunnel. Life was an endless quest of trying to keep the law that never could be kept. Think about it. If the law could have been kept, why send Jesus? It's because we can't keep the law. That's why we needed Jesus. And Israel was was trapped in this cycle of, of trying to do it. You know, at the time of Jesus, the rabbis and the Pharisees had identified from the Pentateuch 613 personal laws that an individual person had to comply with. It's known as the mitzvot, from which you get mitzvah and bar mitzvah. So that when you got to the age of 13 and you had your bar mitzvah, you were becoming a son of the law, (laughs) coming under the law. 613. Over the years, they added over 1,500 interpretations and extrapolations of those laws. If you like, the small print and subclause clauses trying to explain how to keep that law because it was so difficult. And in, or, in order to uh, apply the law to everyday life, to help you to apply that, those 613 personal laws, they added over 1,500 more explanations. And these additions became known as the tradition of the elders, became known as the halka, the way of life, the tradition of the elders. But it was so difficult to follow, it was impossible to follow, that it didn't stop there. They began adding even more extras to try and work around and bypass all the laws that they still couldn't keep. And that's why you get things where Jesus says, you know, you, you, you couldn't keep that law about looking after your parents, so you said, oh, if I just give a gift to charity, then I don't have to do... That's one of the examples. This stuff infuriated Jesus. This is why he was so critical of them. 
they began adding all these extras to try and keep getting around because they knew that if they couldn't keep the law, they were not righteous. But the law kept telling them that they weren't righteous. So they said, okay, let's add something extra so that maybe we'd have a hope. Maybe if we interpret it this way or we interpret it that way, we might have a chance of keeping it. By the time of the New Testament, all this legalistic red tape had become a prison for people, making life almost unbearable for them. And as I said, it infuriated Jesus. He reserved some of his harshest criticism for the Pharisees and the experts in the law who put these burdens on the people yet did nothing to help them and they couldn't keep them themselves. Jesus says you're piling more and more stuff, <coughs> piling more and more stuff on the people. You can't keep it, they can't keep it, so what do you do? Add more, add more, add more. It was a horrible prison. Strain at gnats and you swallow camels, said Jesus. That was a joke in New Testament times. You're straining at gnats and swallowing camels. You clean the outside of the cup, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. Whitewashed sepulchre, sepulchres full of dead men's bones. Let me give you some examples. At the time of Jesus, it was against the law to carry a burden on the Sabbath. So, of course, they had to define a burden. What is a burden? What is carrying a burden? They came up at the time of Jesus with the interpretation that a burden was anything heavier than a dried fig. So, you could not carry anything heavier than a dried fig. Because that was considered work. It was considered carrying a burden. Here's another one. At the time of Jesus, women were not allowed to look at themselves in a mirror on the Sabbath in case they saw a gray hair and were tempted to pull it out. <laughs> in case they saw a gray hair and they were tempted to pull it up, that's a burden. Oh, sorry, that's work. <laughs> Here's another one. This one's fantastic, this one. Walking more than half a mile from your home on the Sabbath violated rabbinic law. So to get around that, another law was added in the tradition of the elders that said you could continue your journey if when you got to the half mile limit, if you turned round and carried on and you were walking backwards. And, if you, and you'd have to be careful of staircases and things like that. Well, I suppose they didn't have staircases, but anyway. So, you could, you, so it would be okay so you could get around it by walking backwards. So if you were walking around in Jesus' time and, and here was a guy uh, and he was walking backwards, you knew he had broken the law. <laughs> because he'd gone more than half a, half a mile away from home, and he's trying to do a cheat. <laughs> so he could get around it. Can you imagine, can you imagine what life must have been like? Those are just three. But it went on and on. You know some of the stories when they, when they picked some grain and they rubbed it in their hands, and, and the Pharisees were saying, oh, that's harvest, that's harvest, that's working, you're working. Can you imagine? You're about to sneeze, you reach for your hanky and someone says, stop, how heavy is that hanky? Wait. Or you're cold and you go to put your coat on and somebody says, stop, that's a burden. How much does that coat weigh? But then you reach the half mile perimeter and you just turn around and walk backwards. <laughs> What about hopping? 
And I would have asked that. I would have said, look, instead of turning around, can I hop? Would that, would that count? Or What kind of image of God did the youngsters have growing up seeing the adults carrying on like this? What did people think God was like when his appointed agents were coming up with stuff like this? It is against this backdrop of suffocating, stifling, restrictive religious red tape that Jesus gives such a simple directive from God. He tells uh, uh, Nicodemus in just a few statements, few short statements, what the good news is and how you can be saved. And it wasn't 613 mitzvot, it wasn't 1500 plus, it was just a few short sentences. And here it is. The first thing, Jesus spoke about God's mission. John 3, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This, my friends, is the mission of God. This is what God was doing in Christ Jesus. He did not come into the world to condemn us. We had done that very well. Thank you very much. We were condemned. Jesus didn't come to add any more condemnation. He came that through him we might be saved. He came to save us. It's as simple as that. Oh, my goodness. He didn't come with a scale to weigh some figs. He didn't come with a measuring tape to see how how far the distance was. He came to save us. That was his mission. That was his mission. Romans 8 and verse 1. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 34. Who is he that condemns you? Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Tell me, my friend, who can condemn you when the glorious Son of God went to the cross for you and came into this world to die for you, to save you, to rise from the dead for you? Who is going to condemn you when the glorious Son of God has done that for you? Who's going to condemn you? My friends, Your visa to heaven has been approved by Jesus. He stamped it himself. He fulfilled all the requirements of the law and then handed the past certificate to you. He didn't come to condemn us, to tell us that we couldn't get to heaven. He came to save us and to open the door to heaven for us. That was the mission of Jesus. Simple as that. The second thing that Jesus said here, God's motive. John 3, 16. For God so loved. For God so loved that he gave his one and only son. This is God's motive. He loved. His motive was never to punish. His motive, his prime objective was not to punish us, but to love us. It's amazing how much bad publicity and fake news surrounds Jesus. 
people think not only that he's come into the world to condemn us, and the opposite is true, they think he's come to punish us, they think God hates them, there's so many people running around, they think God hates them. Oh my goodness, how wrong can you be? How wrong can you be? His motive is love. He loved you, agape love, God kind of love, the sacrificial, self-giving, selfless love. He, his motive was never to take from us or extract from us or demand from us, but to give to us, to give everything to us, to give his only son for us. That was his motive. Oh, don't you know, Paul wrote to the Romans, chapter 2 and verse 4, it's the goodness of God that leads men unto repentance. It's the goodness of God. And Romans 5 and verse 8, this is God's motive, it's grace. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners. So he loved us. The people who think God hates sinners, he does not hate sinners. He doesn't like sin, but he loves people. He loves you and he loves me. He loves us even when we've done wrong, even when we were sinners. Christ died for us. Hebrews 12 and verse 2, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross even for the joy set before him. I've said this many times before. Who's the joy? What was the joy set before him? Look around. Look at the person next to you. Look at someone next to you or behind you. You're looking at the joy. You're looking at the joy that was set before Jesus. And he said, I'll gladly go to the cross for that. I will gladly go to the cross for that joy. My friends, there is no ulterior motive or hidden agenda or sneaky small print in what God has done for us. His motive, selfless, self-giving, sacrificial love. His motive was to help us, to heal us, to bless us, to forgive us, to save us. He asks us to repent, not to avert punishment, but to receive salvation. He asks us to repent, not because he wants to punish us and not have to punish us. He asks us to repent because he wants the door to be open for us to receive his unspeakable and unfathomable riches and blessings of Christ Jesus. And thirdly, God's method, God's method, you must be born again. You must be born again. I'm going to say it again in case there is any person in this building or listening online and you have never been confronted with this, then in the love of Jesus, I confront you with this, my friend. You must be born again. You must be born again. God's mission was to save us. His motive was he loves us. And his method is that we are born again. You see, this is God's method. We're not saved by works. We're not saved by keeping 613 individual laws or over 1,500 rabbinical add-ons and traditions of the elders. None of that saves us. We're not saved. Let me go further. We're not saved by attending church or dressing in a particular way or cleaning up our act or having our hair long or our hair short or by giving money to charity or whatever it is. None of those things save us. You must be born again. God has come in Jesus to save you and he loves you and the way he's going to do it is by you being born again, having a new life. Having a new life. We are saved by grace 
through faith that whoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. Ephesians 2 verses 4 and 5, Paul said, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. We were dead in transgressions, but he's made us alive together with Christ. You must be born again. Ephesians 2.8 For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's the gift of God. It's the gift of God. How insulted would you be if you buy an expensive and you have an expensive gift for someone that is beyond price and you give it to them and they say, well, how much can I give you for this? Oh, well, I've got a fiver. Well, well, is it? <laughs> this is priceless, my friend. I'm giving it to you. God says, my, my children, this is priceless. It's my one and only son. It's my one and only son. I've given him for you. It's my one and only son. You can't, you can't pay me for this. You can't buy this. You can't chip in. You can't whip around. <laughs> it's a gift. It's the gift of God. Titus 3 and verse 5. He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth. You must be born again. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, Paul said, Therefore, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. We are saved, my friends, not by patching up the old life, but by being born again by his mercy, by his grace, through faith, by believing in Jesus, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. We were broken beyond repair, but that is no problem to God. It's not like that. What's that silly program on the TV? I've seen it a couple of times where some woman goes to the dump and somebody's throwing something out and she says, I'll rescue that. And then spends hundreds of pounds rescue, <laughs> rescuing this bit of wood. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not nice. It's, you know, they, they do nice stuff. But you know what? God is not rescuing us by taking some old rubbish and, and trying to polish it up and, and get the rust off it and everything. It's new. We are new. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. We're new. We're brand new. You know, it was, it was a funny incident once. On Marianne's dad, Vinko, when he was alive, he was, a, he was a real Croatian farmer, carpenter kind of character. And one day we were at the farm, uh, this is in Bulawayo, and my sandal broke. The, the leather just snapped on my sandal. And Marianne's dad said, I'll fix it. He said, I'll fix it. So he got, I gave him my sandal. I thought, how's he going to fix this? I've got to see this. So I gave him my sandal. He got a hammer and a six-inch nail and he hammered it through the leather and through the sole of this sandal, turned it over and banged the nail until it was over like that and gave me back a hobnail sandal with one six-inch nail bent over it and underneath. <laughs> I didn't know how to say I would have preferred a new one. <laughs> I would have preferred a new one. As soon as I got home, I tossed that sandal out. <laughs> and I went and got a new My friends, God is not hammering a nail into the sole of your, uh, of your sandal and saying, here, try this. This will fix it. 
The nails went into the cross through Jesus. The nails went into the cross. And he says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Not patched up. And you know, being born again implies a starting point. A journey of growth. A journey towards maturity. Surely I don't need to say to you, dear mums and ladies in the congregation, if your child had been born fully formed, weighing in at 12 stone, <laughs> that would have been the end of the human race. <laughs> Very quickly. <It's laughs> no, you were born. I was born. We were all born the first time round as a baby. When we're born again, it's the start of a journey. We're not the finished product yet. We are saved. We have eternal life. But there's a wonderful work of transformation that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are going to do in our lives. 1 John 3 and verse 2, John wrote there, Dear friends, now, 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 we are the children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. It's a journey, but we know this, the destination is Jesus. <laughs> we're going to look like him. That's the work he's doing in our lives. My friends, we're on the road, we're on the journey to becoming fully-fledged, demon-chasing, mountain-moving, miracle-making sons and daughters of God. And Romans 8 says the whole of creation is groaning and yearning in anticipation, waiting for the revelation of the sons and daughters of God who are moving in this kind of power and authority and understanding that they are new creations, not old, not patched up. Not trying to put a sticking plaster on the wounds of your heart. But he's given you a new heart. He's given you new life. And you're being formed by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And all of this, my friend, is the gift of God. Shall we pray? Hallelujah. Lord, I don't know what to say, Father, except to say thank you. I just want to thank you, Lord. I want to say thank you that you have done it for me. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for coming into the world not to condemn me I was condemned already but you came to save me you came to save every one of us you came not to punish us but because you loved us and wanted to save us and you ask only that we would believe you must be born again. You must be born again. While we're bowed in prayer, if there is anyone here, and I'm just going to be very plain, if you have not been born again, if you have not confessed your sins, confessed your need of Jesus as your Savior, repented and turn to him if you have never done that before in your life. My friends, never too late. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. He's not come to condemn you. He's come to save you. He's not come to punish you. He's come to love you and bless you. And what he's doing is not a patch-up of the old, not just 
He hasn't come to just counsel you through all the old pain and sorrow in your life. He's come giving you new life. If there's anyone who's never prayed like that, but I'm asking you, would you pray like that today? If you're willing to make that prayer and that commitment today, please put your hand up and then put it down and I'll know to pray for you. And I'll know to speak to you. Is there anyone who is saying today, I want to be born again. I want that new life. Is there anyone here? Thank you. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? Father, you know the person who has put their hand up. I thank you so much. Lord, what a joy. Angels in heaven are dancing for joy. (laughs) Dancing with joy right now. Lord, we dance with them to see another one, another one come because of what you've done for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The person who put their hand up afterwards, like a quick word, just to pray for you. I'm going to just ask the Holy Spirit to come. And I I just sense that today, many of us, and I want to put myself in this category, we just need a refreshing of the Spirit. We need to open our, our hands and open our hearts and say, come Holy Spirit. If you want to be included in that prayer, please, please stand, or if you're not able to stand, put your hand up. That's all right. I want to say, well, uh, and if people are standing, that at home, if you've been listening at home and you've wanted to make this prayer of commitment, then please do so. Contact us through the website. Contact us through the the YouTube or whatever it is. I, I don't know how it is that all that works, but the fact that you're watching means you know how some of it works. Then please get in touch with us we would like to pray with you. Father, for those standing right now, I want to pray for the refreshing. And Lord, I'm standing with them with my hands open because, Father, I don't want to get stuck on this journey. I don't want to pull into a lay-by and forget about where I'm going. I want to stay on the road, Lord. I want to stay on this journey. I want to stay with it because, Lord, I have not got there yet. Lord, I understand. I'm beginning to understand more what Paul meant when he wrote to the Philippians and said, I haven't got there yet, but I'm pressing on. Lord, we want more of you. And all those standing with me right now in this, Lord, we're saying, come Holy Spirit, please would you take us further down the road. Come, Holy Spirit, would you breathe upon us? Would you breathe the life of Jesus and the word of Jesus into us? Would you open our eyes and show us more? And Lord, I'm going to be cheeky because, Father, I don't want the old back with a six-inch nail through the sole and the strap. Lord, I want every part of the new life you've promised and offered. Lord, we're standing because we want new life, the life of Jesus, the life of Jesus. Thank you for the gift, Lord. Thank you for the gift. I'm not asking, we're not asking for something you didn't promise. We're coming in faith to receive what you did promise. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray myself included, that every one of us this week, this day, would experience the breathing and the breeze and the blowing of the Holy Spirit. Shaking cobwebs, dusting us down. Those of us who have stopped and pulled in at the roadside, Father, I'm praying that there would be a new impetus on the journey. I'm asking, Father, 
or those who have been weighed down by stuff from the old. I pray, Father, that even now you would lift the burdens of the old from hearts and minds and shoulders and that, Lord, that they would take your yoke upon themselves to just believe in the Son of God. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that this is a week of a fresh wind blowing. Today is a day of a fresh wind blowing. Today is a day of a fresh wind. In Jesus' name. Stubborn things that have refused to budge, we speak to you in Jesus' name. The problems, the hang ups, the pain. We speak to you in Jesus' name and say, Behold, all things are new. All things are new. Jesus is renewing us. It's the rebirth and it's renewal in the Holy Spirit. Renewal in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. I know, Lord, there are some here today who would not voice or speak out about the deepest thing in their heart, but I'm praying, Lord, that you know what it is, and even at this moment, the thing that has caused them the deepest pain and the deepest shame, that, Holy Spirit, you would bring the healing of Jesus into that situation, into those hearts and minds that have been weighed down. New life, new life, new life, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Please, please be seated. Um, there were... Uh, we announced a, a, a week or so ago that there was, going, there was going to be a baptism soon. If, if you are one of those who's interested in the baptism, um, and uh, if you could just stay back for a few minutes and we'll have a, a word uh, about the baptism and see if we can fix up a date and get a date sorted. If you are here today, you've been born again, but you're not yet baptized, come and speak to me after the service with the others. Um, uh, and uh, we'll talk about baptism and explain about baptism. The Lord bless you. Amen. <laughs>